Good afternoon and thank you for joining us for today's briefing. I want to start this afternoon by updating you on some key statistics in relation to COVID-19 in Scotland. As at nine o'clock this morning, there have been 15,621 positive cases confirmed, an increase of 18 since yesterday. A total of 1,002 patients are in hospital with COVID-19, including 646 who've been confirmed as having the virus. This represents a total reduction of 17 since the numbers reported yesterday, although the number of confirmed cases is unchanged. A total of 25 people last night were in intensive care with confirmed or suspected COVID-19, and that is an increase of five since yesterday. I'm also able to confirm today that since the 5th of March, a total of 3,801 patients who had tested positive for the virus have been able to leave hospital, and I wish all of them well. In the last 24 hours, no deaths have been registered of patients who have confirmed through a test as having COVID-19. That means that the total number of deaths in Scotland under that measurement remains at 2,415. However, I would offer a note of caution about reading too much into today's figure. We know that fewer deaths tend to be registered at the weekend than on other days of the week. It is still very likely that further COVID deaths will be reported in the days ahead. And as always, I want to stress that the numbers I'm reading out are not simply statistics. Every one of those 2,415 people who have died was an individual whose loss is a source of grief and sorrow to very many. So I want to send my deepest condolences to everyone who's lost a loved one. As Health Secretary, I also want to once again thank those working in our health and care sectors. Thanks that is due to everyone working across all the settings, from GP practices and COVID assessment centres to emergency dental and eye care, NHS 24, care homes, hospitals, and also to our paramedics, our procurement specialists, our porters, cleaners, cooks, maintenance staff. All of them help to keep the NHS and social care running and working. And all of us owe you an immense debt of gratitude. Your work is essential to the health and well-being of everyone in Scotland. The week ahead is Carers Week, and so the main focus of my remarks today will be on young carers. However, before that, I want to update you briefly on two issues. Firstly, the border control measures, which implement a 14-day period of self-isolation for all those arriving in Scotland from outside the common travel area. Those have been made today and will come into force tomorrow. The Justice Secretary, Hamza Yusuf, who has joined me today, will say more about them in a few moments. Secondly, I want to say something about the issue of wearing medical grade face masks across the NHS. As part of our framework for the remobilisation of the NHS, the framework for the decision making I published last week, we know it is crucial to ensure the right personal protective equipment is available. So that means that we don't make snap overnight announcements. Instead, we're working with clinicians, with professional bodies, with NHS boards and unions about how best to implement the use of PPE across the NHS. And we will provide you with an update on that later this week. The final issue I want to talk about is Carers Week. There are approximately 690,000 people in Scotland <coughs> excuse me, who provide care and support for another family member, neighbour or friend. Carers Week provides us with an opportunity to recognise, celebrate the contribution they make. <coughs> excuse me. I know that the COVID crisis will have been a difficult time for many carers. You will have been worried about your own health and the health of those you care for. Those worries will, in some cases, have been heightened by not being able to physically meet other people during lockdown and could also have been accompanied by concerns about your employment and your future prospects. For all, <coughs> for all carers, I want you to remember that help is available 
and that you should seek support if you need it. Carers' centres are operating online and on the phone, and they can provide you with information, advice and support. There are approximately 29,000 young carers in Scotland. That's young people aged 18 or less who provide care for someone else. In many cases, young carers have fewer opportunities than other people of their own age, since they have more responsibility and less free time. We already provide a small young carers grant for carers aged between 16 and 18 who care for more than 16 hours a week. But we recognise that the COVID-19 outbreak will have been especially tough for many young carers, many of whom will not have been able to take a break from their caring responsibilities at all. So today we are providing a further £305,000 worth of support for young carers almost two-thirds of which will be allocated to Young Scott. This funding will help to provide vouchers and subscription packages to improve carers' quality of life. It will also help us to expand our small grant scheme called Time to Live. It's a small, but I hope significant way in which we can support young people while they provide support for family members or loved ones. I'm just about to hand over to the Justice Secretary and the National Clinical Director. <clears throat> but before I do that, I would like to restate once again our key public health messages. The message remains, stay at home. Do not meet other people outdoors. There are now, of course, a few reasons to leave home, but because the chances of the virus being transmitted to other people is far higher if you're indoors, our message is do not meet people indoors. When you do meet people outside, do not meet with more than one household at a time, don't meet more than one household a day, and keep to a maximum of eight people in a group. Please stay two metres apart when you do meet. Wash your hands regularly and thoroughly, and avoid touching hard surfaces that other households will then touch themselves and clean any surfaces that you're touching. Don't travel more than five miles from your home. And please do not crowd beauty spots, rural locations, or small villages. Car parks in these locations remain closed. They're closed for a reason, to stop crowding. So please don't ignore that. Don't park on verges or at the side of the road as an alternative. That is unsafe. And if where you go is crowded, Change your plans and go elsewhere. If you have symptoms, please contact NHS 24 or the NHS Inform website to get a test and follow the advice on self-isolation. And please remember that the decisions that each of us make as individuals affects just not our own well-being and that of our family, but it affects the health and well-being of us all. So my decisions affect you and your decisions will affect me. Fundamentally, your life should not be feeling just yet as though it is returning to normal. If it does, please ask yourself why that feels that way now, when all those restrictions remain in place. The reason we've been able to start emerging from lockdown is because all of us together have reduced the number of COVID cases and slowed the rate at which the virus spreads. We've only achieved that because so many of you have done the right thing and have stuck to the rules. So thank you to everyone who has played a part in that progress and please stick with it. By keeping to the rules, we'll continue to protect ourselves and our communities and we will bring forward the time when we can take further steps out of lockdown. I'll now ask Professor Jason Leach, our National Clinical Director, to say a few words. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And I just want to briefly build on your point around carers. Since the onset of the coronavirus pandemic, the number of people who are in a caring role has dramatically increased across the country. We know that right now, even today, this weekend, hundreds of thousands of people are caring for relatives, for friends and partners across Scotland. So this afternoon, I'd like to take the opportunity with the Cabinet Secretary, to recognise and thank every one of you. Next week is Carers Week, an, an annual campaign which aims to raise awareness of carers in our society. 
Many people who are looking after partners, relatives and friends don't think of themselves as carers, and yet this campaign and this week is to celebrate their contribution. It is to raise awareness and help people to access much needed support. Looking after someone can be hard work. It can be harder work during a pandemic like we're experiencing. And carers often miss out on the support services available to them and the added pressure of caring during a pandemic only makes this situation worse. It is incredibly important that carers are able to access the support and help they need if they are able to continue with their vital role. And the Scottish Government is in regular contact with Carers Scotland and other carer organisations, working to make sure that carers have access to the right advice to help protect them. We have established a fund of £500,000 to help local carer organisations to transition to supporting carers remotely because they can't meet face to face. And we're working with our third sector partners to ensure that carers have access to breaks, including the extra support for young carers that you've just heard announced by the Cabinet Secretary. Caring can often lead to feelings of loneliness, being disconnected from friends and families, and these feelings have been magnified by the restrictions around this virus and physical distancing. It is vital that anyone who requires support for their mental well-being can also receive it. So we've also launched a national Clear Your Head campaign to help people cope during this coronavirus pandemic, not just for carers, but for the whole population. This campaign highlights the practical things people can do to help them feel better whilst continuing to stay at home. You can find out more by visiting the campaign website at clearyourhead.scot. So next week, and in fact every week, let's all recognise, support and respect Scotland's carers for the truly remarkable job they are doing at such a challenging time. Perhaps you could find a carer that you could thank in the week ahead. Cabinet Secretary, thank you. Thanks, Jason. And now Justice Secretary Hamza Yusuf. Thank you, Jim. I will speak to two key matters today. Uh, Black Lives Matter protests and also provide an update on new health measures for travellers to Scotland. First and foremost, I want to express my enduring support for the Black Lives Matters movement and for all the organisations and individuals who have made their voices heard and spoken out against racial injustice right across the world. As I've said earlier this week, the understandable anger from George Floyd's death has exposed again the sad truth that racism continues to blight every nation on earth, that no society, including Scotland, can claim to be immune from it. We must come together to eradicate it. I've been an anti-racist campaigner my whole life. I've been the victim of racism. I've stood in solidarity with others who have been targeted by racists. So I fully understand and feel the anger and the sadness that has led to people wanting to gather today to show solidarity and community at this challenging time. But the threat from COVID-19 remains with us. And that is why I urge people not to attend mass gatherings, which pose a clear risk to public health, even with social distancing in place. Indeed, we've seen evidence of the disproportionate impact that COVID-19 has on people from black and minority ethnic communities in the UK. So street protests could pose an additional risk to the very people whose lives we are saying matter and which must be equally protected from harm as people of all races. So I'm urging people to explore alternative ways to make their voices heard on this vital issue, including, uh, for example, through social media, there are a number of online protests being set up by engaging with friends, by engaging with family and other such as work colleagues. And as ever, I would encourage anyone who is a victim of a racist hate incident, or indeed a witness to one, to please contact Police Scotland or one of the third-party reporting centres that continue to provide the service by telephone or online. In Scotland, we value our diverse, diverse minority ethnic communities, the vital contribution they make. We, uh, we support and, 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 and appreciate the important role they play in enriching our country, socially, culturally, and indeed economically. However, the events in the US, they do force us to hold a mirror up to ourselves and can confront the overt or indeed the structural racism that exists within our society here in Scotland. Uh, we cannot, we will not tolerate hate crime, prejudice, discrimination or racism of any kind. As I've said in recent days, it's not enough 
to simply say that you're not a racist. We must be loudly and unequivocally anti-racist by supporting our minority ethnic communities and condemning racism, hate and injustice wherever we find it. <clears throat> now I'll move on to new health measures for travellers to Scotland. Uh, I'd like to outline the public health measures in response to COVID-19, which will be introduced from tomorrow to help prevent new cases being brought into Scotland. The range of measures will be broadly similar across the four nations of the UK. They're aimed at controlling the spread of infection at a time when levels of infection in Scotland are falling. From tomorrow, anyone travelling to Scotland from abroad must self-isolate on arrival for 14 days. This time period reflects the incubation period for the virus. Arrivals to Scotland will be required to fill in a passenger locator form before they travel, including details of where they will isolate and how they can be contacted. Border Force will have responsibility for enforcing this requirement through spot checks. The information provided by travellers will be used to allow for some of those arriving into Scotland to be contacted during their time of self-isolation to provide public health advice, information and guidance. The regulations which will come into force tomorrow will also provide powers for police officers to issue a fixed penalty notice to anyone failing to comply with self-isolation conditions and the ability to report persistent offenders to the Procurator Fiscal for potential prosecution. As with current regulations, these will only be used where absolutely necessary. We've worked with our colleagues in the UK government and across other devolved administrations to introduce these public health requirements. Uh, currently, there is guidance against all but essential travel. However, we recognise that Scotland's tourism sector has been hit hard by this pandemic. It is essential, however, however that measures are taken which can, can help prevent transmission of COVID-19 and protect public health. We have put in place unprecedented financial support for businesses and we continue to listen to feedback in assessing what more can be done. It's important to note that these new measures are temporary and will not be in place any longer than deemed necessary to protect public health. As with other measure, measures, we are required to keep them under review every three weeks. Thank you. Thanks very much, Hamza. Let's go now to the journalists who've joined us this afternoon. And first of those is Alexandra McKenzie from the BBC. Justice Secretary, can I ask you, how concerned are you that people have been gathering in Edinburgh and on Glasgow Green today to protest? Are lives being put at risk by doing that? Thank you uh, for the question. I am concerned. Uh, it's why I, alongside uh, long-time anti-racist campaigners like Amar Anwar and a sour MSP, uh, Caddy Johnson, who's the sister uh, of Sheikh Obayan, also happens to be a nurse working in our NHS. That's why we signed a joint statement urging people to use alternative means to protest uh, in terms of online protests or indeed social media. So it is a concern, the numbers that we see gathering in Glasgow Green, uh, the numbers that we see uh, in Holyrood Park uh, as well. I, I did speak to the Chief Constable uh, just over an hour ago for an update, and he tells me there is good social distancing, physical distancing being put in place. But as I said in my remarks, even with that in place, even with people wearing face coverings, uh, mass outdoor gatherings like this uh, could present uh, risk to public health. And we do know that there is uh, a num uh, quite a lot of evidence now coming forward, certainly from the UK government, on the disproportionate impact that COVID-19 uh, can have on the minority ethnic community. So the very people's lives, we say, that matter, and do, of course, uh, matter, are the very lives that people may well be putting uh, at risk. So uh, to, to answer your question, yes, uh, it does give me a great degree of concern. Thank you. Next, Louise Jose from STV. Yes, thank you. Um, Justice Secretary, on the quarantine measures that you've just been outlining, how confident are you that these can be enforced? And do you believe you will have the, the full support and the cooperation of the public in complying with these measures? And a second question to the Health Secretary, if I may. In terms of reports that more than 900 patients may have contracted coronavirus in Scottish hospitals after being admitted for another condition, you say that we need to validate the data. 
but why can the regular testing of NHS hospital staff not be rolled out right now as a matter of urgency? And do you accept that if this had been carried out m much earlier, it could potentially have saved lives? So, Hamza, do you want to answer first? So the first thing to, to say in relation to compliance is let's not forget the Scottish people, the Scottish public, have done incredibly and immensely well uh, in relation to very, very difficult restrictions. That certainly I, as the Justice Secretary, would never have thought I would see uh, in, in my lifetime. So the vast majority of the general public, the Scottish public, ha have done incredibly well when it comes to, to, to that compliance. And I would expect that when it comes to these uh, self-isolation measures, these public health measures we put at the borders, that they would equally be uh, good levels uh, of compliance. But uh, where enforcement action is necessary, there are enforcement powers there. There's two separate offences, uh, one in relation to uh, the disclosure or failure to disclose uh, appropriate information, and border force uh, will uh, enforce that if necessary through uh, a fine which can be escalated um, up to a maximum uh, of £480. Similarly to the police, they can give a £480 uh, fixed penalty notice, but if there is persistent offenders in both cases, in both instances, uh, these offences can be uh, reported to the fiscal, of where there's a £5,000 uh, maximum fine there in terms of prosecution. So there's really strong enforcement uh, around this, but of course, as always, as Police Scotland uh, have said, certainly on uh, for, for, for where they have remit, and responsibility. They will take a common sense approach, they will explain, they would encourage, uh, they will educate, and only as a last resort, if necessary, uh, they will then enforce. Thanks very much. And on the second question, I may uh, ask uh, Jason to come in on this too. Uh, the numbers that you refer to uh, are numbers uh, over the period from the 18th of March to the 3rd of June. And the reason why uh, we need to validate those figures is in part because of the difficulty of identifying whether someone uh, acquired the virus in hospital or on the point when they were admitted, they already had the virus, bearing in mind that the virus incubation period is uh, up to 14 days. So that work needs to go on. Uh, Public Health Scotland and uh, National Services Scotland are engaged in doing that work uh, to validate exactly how many of that uh, number uh, we do believe acquired the infection in hospital uh, and also obviously the, the number of those who died where COVID-19 was a contributing factor to their death from that uh, 980, uh, how many of that number had acquired the infection in hospital as opposed to uh, had it uh, at the point when they were admitted. Uh, and all of that, having that data validated and being confident and sure about it is really important. And our uh, intention is, on the assumption that it will be completed uh, very shortly, that we will publish that information by the end of June. Now, on the question about testing and testing of NHS staff, uh, when uh, the pandemic uh, and the NHS was preparing itself for the pandemic, one of the very many things it did was create red and green zones in order to ensure that as far as possible, uh, you could keep apart those patients who were known to either have COVID-19 symptoms or subsequently tested to have COVID-19 symptoms. Uh, the testing of NHS staff is now, uh, they were always, of course, key workers, so if they were symptomatic, they would have been tested, or if one of their family was symptomatic and they were isolating at home because of that, then they were a priority for those tests. Uh, the testing of NHS workers now is part of the consideration as we begin to restart in that uh, phased and uh, gentle way uh, areas of our health service which have been paused in order to scale up to meet the pandemic, uh, considering uh, in those areas whether or not there is the evidence and the advice uh, from the clinical teams themselves, uh, as well, of course, from uh, our own advisors, uh, like Professor Leach and others, whether the evidence is there to support testing of NHS staff in certain areas of healthcare in particular. For example, Cancer Research UK has asked about the creation of a safe space uh, for the uh, re-emergence of some of the cancer treatments 
that were paused for those clinical reasons in terms of dealing with the pandemic and the assessment of the risk to patients. So that work is all underway. And as we take those decisions, then we will, of course, uh, make those known uh, to the wider public and, importantly, to patients themselves. Jason, do you want to add anything to that? Perhaps the... the and I, I, I don't wish to... Uh, suggest any healthcare-acquired infection is to be taken lightly. But healthcare-acquired infections are a consequence of every healthcare system in the world where you put very sick people in institutions. Scotland has a globally recognised reputation in dealing with healthcare-acquired infections through our Scottish Patient Safety Programme and a decade of deep, deep work by thousands of people to deal with C. difficile, to do with MRSA, all these other infections. And that has stood us in good stead to deal with this virus. But it does under, underline how challenging this particular infection agent is. It is horrible. It's really, really difficult to manage everywhere in the community, but also in institutions. Pending the data we will get about where these people, as far as possible, we can tell whether they got them in the institution or brought it in with them. The important thing has been infection and prevention control measures inside institutions, both care homes and in hospitals. The PPE, the correct division of labour between hot zones and cold zones. Testing is only part of that. It's very important, but it cannot find all the virus. That, that's just the fact of the present swab test. It cannot find all the virus. So you have to put in place, of course, testing appropriately, clinically used, but also infection control measures, PPE, and hot and cold zones inside your institutions. Thanks very much. Uh, Tom Eden from PA. Thank you, Health Secretary, um, and good afternoon. Um, I just want to ask about the, the hospital infections. I know you've covered it and mentioned about verifying data and things, um, but the answer you gave on Thursday, um, you said there was 125 incidents involving COVID cases outside the COVID-19 wards, um, which was which you specified was incidents of suspected transmission in hospitals. Um, 24 hours later, it's revealed that that number was more than 900. Um, can you clarify where the discrepancy was in that, please? Yeah, thanks very much. I, th I think clearly the discrepancy is between describing incidents, which is one or more case, and how that... Uh, that is a standard description of infections in hospital potential, hospital acquired or healthcare acquired infections and the number of patients that are affected. Uh, so 125 is the correct number of incidents. 121 of them uh, have now been closed. And 980 is the correct number of patients who have been affected. But now the data has to be validated to try and understand uh, as far as we can, uh, within the, the now agreed definition, how many of those individuals acquired that infection in hospital and how many were already incubating, incubating the virus on admission to hospital. So that's straightforwardly the uh, explanation between those two numbers. Chris Musson now from The Sun. A uh, question to the uh, Justice Secretary on the fixed penalty notice for breaches of quarantine. Um, you mentioned £480 earlier in an answer, but is this for after five breaches? So is the minimum set to £30 as officials were discussing? And if so, can you address these concerns that this isn't much of a deterrent? So thanks, uh, Chris. So there's two separate offences, one that's enforced by Border Force and one that's enforced uh, reactively by, by, by Police Scotland. On the border force, which is related to the information or the lack thereof of information coming from a passenger, uh, that would be your standard £60 fine, which can be reduced to 30 if it's paid within uh, early timescales. And that then, for per offence, is doubled up to the maximum. It could be 500 but it would, in, in reality it would be £480. Uh, Whereas the second uh, offence which I spoke about, which is the one, again, that will be enforced by Police Scotland, which is around if somebody breaches... Uh, those self-isolation measures, then that would be a, a, a fixed £480 uh, fixed penalty notice and the ability uh, in both instances to then escalate that uh, to the Procurator Fiscal. So I do think these will act as uh, appropriate deterrents. My hope is, of course, that that enforcement action will not be needed and we'll see the good levels of compliance 
uh, that we have seen uh, thus far. Thanks very much. Uh, Simon Johnson from The Telegraph. Hi, Health Secretary. Um, yeah, it's obviously good news today about no deaths here and in Northern Ireland. Um, in Northern Ireland, tomorrow, they're re reopening a range of shops with lower customer density, such as furniture shops, electrical appliance shops, etc. Um, isn't it time to start basically looking at doing that a bit more here? Um, the Scottish Retail Consortium is saying they've given no indication about when stores are opening, and with zero deaths, shouldn't, shouldn't we be looking at trying to sort of um, limit the economic scarring that this is causing and the loss of jobs? Um, and just for the Justice Secretary, just a quick clarification on the answer to, to Chris. Um, th these levels are quite a bit lower than in England, where I think it's £100 for the for the filling in the form aspect and the thousand pounds for the breaching the um breaching the quarantine aspect i just wanted to to ask why you might why you decided to set them so much lower okay let me answer your, your first question simon um as i said at the start of this briefing i want us to treat that zero number with some caution uh, because it is the weekend and we have seen uh, every week after a weekend, the numbers of deaths that are reported uh, over the weekend are, are lower than you would see uh, on a weekday. And that is because fewer deaths are registered over the weekend. So on the one hand, uh, it, it is positive news, uh, and I wouldn't want to detract from that. Uh, I, I would always want to stand here reporting no deaths, um, and any right-minded person would. But I need us to be cautious about that figure and not read too much into it for the reasons I've just described. And that applies overall to the progress that we've made. We said uh, not so long ago that we have made, we, you, the public, by abiding by the um, restrictions around lockdown, have secured progress in how we've managed to keep the virus under control. But that progress is fragile and the amount of room we have to manoeuvre within that progress remains small. Uh, and so we are not in the business of rushing out announcements on the back of, albeit a piece of positive news, but a one-off piece of positive news um, in the context of the weekend when we know that the number of registered deaths uh, are lower than in a weekday. So I want us to continue to make the progress. I want to be here on many, many more days where either I or the First Minister are giving those kind of numbers. But for us to get there, we need to stick with the measures that are in place. Stay at home remains the message. Those additional easing of restrictions are important, but we can't go beyond those. That's how we will get to the next review date. And if progress continues, we may be able to move to the next step, may be able to move to the next step in the overall route map. And that route map does set out uh, the areas where we would want to make progress, providing we continue to be successful in keeping the incidence of the virus down in Scotland uh, and managing uh, to minimise the number of people who are infected, the number who are hospitalised, the number who go, have to go into ICU, and, of course, the number of deaths. Uh, Hamza, yeah. there was a question I'll, for I'll you. I'll pick up Simon's uh, point. So, Simon, that essentially two answers to your question. Uh, one is in terms of the border force uh, offence or the offence that the border force will enforce. That aligns with our coronavirus uh, regulations up here in Scotland. But secondly, also because in various different legal jurisdictions uh, across the UK, there are different levels by which you would then uh, find levels by which you would have to report to the procurator fiscal. So if we, uh, that, light, that, that, that uh, limit at the moment in Scotland, or that threshold in Scotland is £500. So therefore, if there's a £1,000 fine, uh, that individual would have to be reported to the procurator of the fiscal, which doesn't seem a proportionate step to take as a first enforcement measure. So therefore, it fits into, uh, fits into line or aligns with uh, what our thresholds are uh, in relation to, to fiscal fines. Thank you. Next is Rachel Watson from the Daily Mail. Health Secretary, could I just go back to the hospital acquired COVID infections? Um, you first described it as incidents and then obviously the figures came out as the number of patients. Yesterday, you have been accused of trying to hide the scale of the problem by 
opponents. What is your response to that? And also to the Justice Secretary. There's images today of people gathered outside pubs, standing in areas um, owned by those pubs um, with their kind of takeaway pints or drinks that they've got. What's your response? And what would you say to those businesses who haven't kind of cleared the front of their businesses after people get takeaway? Is there action the government can take? So let me respond uh, to the first part of your question, Rachel. My response is absolutely not. I'm not trying to conceal anything. I don't think anyone, any reasonable person, could consider that the Scottish government in any respect has been anything other than transparent and open about the statistics and the information uh, that we have when we are confident of that information. And that's why, uh, even though the numbers have not been validated, we released those numbers. Uh, but the validation is the important part of the work that needs to be done. Now, that validation will then be, and I hope it is uh, ready to be published by the end of this month, that validation will then help inform us of the additional work that we may need to do in the hospital setting as we begin to reopen the NHS. But a great deal of work, some of which uh, Jason has described, is already underway in our hospitals on the back of an excellent track record on patient safety. So staff working in our NHS in the hospital setting and elsewhere are uh, well embedded in knowing exactly what to do for infection prevention and control in that setting. They have the right PPE. We have never run out of PPE. We have the right PPE. They know what to wear in different settings. We will take those decisions, as I said in my opening comments, around the wearing of uh, surgical masks in a number of other clinical settings uh, in the proper way, following consultation and agreement. And when the figures that have been released are validated, we will release those figures and we will take questions at that point. But the idea that we are hiding or concealing or anything is dragged from us is, frankly, nonsense. Hamza. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Rachel, for, <clears throat> for the question. So I suppose it's important to remember that a, a number of takeaways and hot food outlets have been open for, for, for a number of months uh, because uh, of the exemptions that existed uh, within uh, phase zero, within uh, lockdown measures, and therefore people congregating outside of those establishments or indeed uh, any other establishments that are allowed to be open uh, is not necessarily a, a new problem or, or a new issue. And Police Scotland have taken and always will take a very proportionate response uh, to that and, and, and will continue to do that. Now, if we have to look at further messaging uh, around people congregating uh, outdoors, then, then, then of course, as a government, we will like to do, look to do that. You'll remember, of course, that the First Minister uh, expressed with a degree of frustration that we all share uh, some of the images that we saw from last weekend and our consideration as a government of whether we have to move certain uh, initiatives from, from the, uh, pieces of guidance into, in, into regulation. Um, and, and clearly we're going to wait to see how, how this, this weekend uh, uh, pans out. I spoke to the Chief Constable, as I say, just over an hour ago, and there's a strong caveat here. We're, we're still, of course, uh, very much in the weekend, and we'll wait to see um, what the figures are uh, tomorrow. Uh, but initial indications uh, are that uh, there has been significantly at less need for police to use their enforcement uh, measures this weekend uh, in comparison to last weekend. So that's a positive that we're hopefully seeing uh, the levels of good compliance that we've seen uh, re re return. Thank you. Uh, David Ball from The Herald. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, can I ask that on reflection, do you wish the routine testing of NHS staff had taken place from the start of the pandemic? Um, can people have confidence going into hospitals for other reasons that they're not picking up the virus? And can I also ask whether the Scottish Government is concerned that if we see a surge in staycations, if it is safe to relax some travel restrictions, uh, will ferries uh, be able to cope with the increased demand? Thanks very much. Let, let me answer that last part of your question uh, first. Uh, obviously, that is uh, in terms of ferries and whether ferries could cope if we get to a point where there is a relaxation in travel uh, requirements. Uh, so that's a significant caveat. Uh, and as a consequence of that, we see 
uh, more people uh, taking holidays in and around Scotland. Those are obviously uh, areas that the uh, Transport Secretary, Michael Matheson, is considering carefully. Uh, at the moment, what all of us are focused on is making sure that the current restrictions in uh, this initial phase uh, are met and are held to. Uh, Justice Secretary has just referred the consideration that we will give uh, whether or not areas currently in guidance should have to uh, go into regulation. I hope not, because I hope that the population of Scotland continue to abide by uh, the restrictions that are in place. But those other matters will be considered uh, as we uh, go through the coming weeks and see how we are doing, how we are collectively doing across the country in terms of uh, controlling the spread of the virus uh, and making sure that we're taking uh, as much uh, scientific and clinical advice uh, available to us in order to reach any future decisions. In terms of your other question, uh, I think the, the, the point about confidence of patients going into hospital, yes, I think patients should have confidence going into our hospitals. I've touched on already the uh, global recognition of Scotland's health service in terms of patient safety. That didn't disappear when the pandemic arrived. That was something of a strong foundation for us to build on in our response to that pandemic. And it's still there and it's still with us. And as I've said, and I'm going to turn to Professor Leach in a minute to talk a bit more about that, uh, our NHS staff uh, know very well and practice every day the importance of infection prevention and control, the importance of patient safety. What we're doing now as we look to restart areas of the health service in that gradual and importantly safe way that I've described more than once is whether or not doing that whilst we still have the virus, remember it hasn't gone away, whether or not in those uh, certain clinical areas we should introduce additional measures which can include testing of staff in those areas as well as uh, what I said earlier about uh, additional use of surgical masks. We will uh, take those decisions based on clinical advice and consultation with those involved and as soon as we have done that, we won't take a long time to do it, but as soon as we have done it, we will make sure that that is publicly known and patients are given that additional information because there may be additional measures that we want patients to take as well. Jason, do you want to add anything? It, it feels like a lifetime ago, but in 2010, the Scottish Health Service was the first health service in the world to publish a quality strategy based on three core principles, safe, effective, and person-centered. And the remobilization plans that are being designed in June 2020 are based on those three core principles, safe, effective, and person-centered. So you shouldn't be surprised that the clinical teams all over the country, hundreds and thousands of workers, are working on that remobilization based on it being safe for those they serve. None of them want to put anybody at risk. Healthcare is not, unfortunately, a risk-free occupation. It, it cannot be risk-free. But we in Scotland make it as safe as it can possibly be and effective and person-centred. So the person-centred piece is a separate bit. That's about perhaps soon reopening to visitors a little bit more. It's about asking patients and families what matters to them rather than what we think matters. So th those principles haven't gone away. In fact, they are embedded in the remobilisation plans. Thanks very much. And now Chris McCall from The Daily Record. I can you hear me? Can hear you, Chris, and I can see you now hi, as well. Hi, can you hear me now? Sorry, sorry. Um, a question for the Justice Secretary. Um, having spoken to the police, are you in a position to say if Scots have generally been behaving when outdoors this weekend and whether the number of dispersal orders has dropped from last week? I, did, I spoke to the Chief Constable uh, just over uh, an hour ago and there's caveats to what I'm about to say because, of course, we've still got to wait for Sunday figures and we've still got to collate, or Police Scotland still have to collate uh, the data. But he was very comfortable with me uh, saying that in terms of compliance, um, this weekend uh, they have had, the police have had to uh, use enforcement powers 
significantly less times, and fewer times, I should say, uh, than, than they had to do uh, in previous weekends. So the signs are positive in that respect. Bear in mind we have the Black Lives Matters protests, which are, are I think, still ongoing probably uh, at, at this time. So those figures uh, may, may well go up uh, in relation to compliant uh, dispersals. But the early indications, and please accept all the caveats around that because we don't have uh, the official data yet, but the early signs that the Chief Constable tells me uh, is that compliance has been better uh, this weekend and there has been significantly less uh, enforcement action needed by Police Scotland. Thank you. Uh, Gina Davidson now from The Scotsman. Hi, thank you, Health Secretary. Um, given the, the protests that are happening this weekend weren't really on um, the government's agenda just over a week or so ago, what modelling are you now doing around the impact that they might have, plus the drinking that we've seen outside pubs this weekend, uh, in terms of the R rate and when uh, the next spike might actually come? And can I also ask about the hospital acquired infections? We know that care home staff were concerned about transmitting the virus in their care homes and the government said that they shouldn't move between care homes. At any point did the government tell health boards not to employ care home staff who also happened to be on the nursing bank who were maybe going between care homes and hospital? So in terms of the, the modelling that we do, uh, and how that is done. I'll ask Jason to say a bit of that. But remember, we have said all along, we said it as we went into lockdown, that each measure uh, of restriction as we went into lockdown, uh, you needed two to three weeks to see the impact that would have on reducing the virus uh, before you could take a decision about whether or not there was a further measure uh, to restrict the, the uh, transmission of the virus. So that, similarly, as you... Uh, ease measures uh, under lockdown, uh, as we have done for phase one, you need two to three weeks to see what the impact of that is uh, on uh, the R number and the, the prevalence incidence of uh, cases and so on uh, in terms of the virus. And that's why the review periods are three weeks apart. Uh, so uh, the modelling that will be done will take all of that into account and tell us whether or not there has been a significant uh, impact on the uh, number of cases of the virus and the R number. Uh, but Jason may want to see a bit more about that uh, before I come back to your other question. Two, two things to, to reinforce that the three-week review wasn't coincidental. The politicians didn't just come up with that. The scientific advice is that you need three weeks to make these choices because Roughly speaking, this virus works in three-week chunks. It's an average. It's not exact in every individual, but it takes a week to get it. You're sick for a week, and you may recover. If you're not going to recover, you get very sick in week three. So therefore, our hospital admission rate takes about two weeks to show. So last weekend's actual effects won't be known until later this week. And even then, because it's an average, it, it changes over a few days. So the advisors won't be able to advise at least for another week about what's happening to the lead indicators of hospital admissions, new positive tests. Remember though, we've also at the same time as moving to phase one, introduced test and protect. Another layer of protection which we haven't had before, which is isolating people with symptoms, which we've always done, but is also isolating asymptomatic people who were contacts of the symptomatic person, which we haven't done before. So that gives us more confidence. So those layers have to be laid on top of one another in the advice and then a judgment made by the Cabinet Secretary and the First Minister. And uh, on the other part of your question, Gina, about um, care home workers who may be part of the bank and then may be used in a hospital setting, then uh, hospitals, are when they look to use uh, people from the bank, do go through uh, uh, exercise about what skills they need and who they need and so on. And given the importance of the Scottish Patient Safety Programme, uh, then they would be taking into account uh, where an individual may have worked before. Very often, bank staff are going back to uh, the area where they have worked before because they know uh, the layout of a particular ward or that patient cohort or whatever it might be. Uh, one of the things that uh, has been raised with me is a reduction 
Uh, I don't have the exact figures, but it has been raised a concern about, uh, on the part of those on the bank, about a reduction in the uh, level of use because we have taken those steps uh, of uh, ensuring that so many of our student nurses and student midwives uh, have uh, entered the hospital setting uh, in advance of finally completing their training as part of completing their training. Uh, and we were very uh, grateful to see them uh, being prepared to do that uh, as they approach the final uh, period of their, uh, their training before becoming uh, fully qualified as nurses or midwives. And next we have uh, Artie uh, Nachiapin from The Times. Hi, thank you for accommodating my question. I've got one for the Justice Secretary. So, um, Willie Walsh, the Chief Executive of the International Airlines Group, pointed out in a letter sent to government ministers that there are loopholes in the plans to impose a 14-day quarantine for those arriving in the UK from overseas. Um, so, he pointed out that the law would only apply to those arriving in England, but not in Scotland, Wales or Northern Ireland. So, with that in mind, are you confident that you'll be able to enforce this legislation in Scotland from tomorrow? The short answer to the question is yes. Uh, these uh, measures will come into place uh, one minute past uh, midnight and will be in force uh, tomorrow. Uh, we have, of course, uh, devised the regulations that uh, fit for Scotland, that are appropriate for Scotland. Uh, and, of course, where those uh, matters involve the Border Force, there's been good engagement, consultation and discussion with the Border Force. And where those matters involve Police Scotland, there's been really extensive consultation and conversation uh, with Police Scotland. But again, bearing in mind my answer to previous questions, thus far Police Scotland's approach has very much been a common sense uh, approach, has been a proportionate uh, uh, response and an approach. Uh, they will continue to maintain that, but where there is a need for enforcement uh, measures uh, from a Police Scotland perspective as well, I can see that the enforcement is, is, is a very strong enforcement and, and, and deterrent indeed, £480 fine, with the ability, if necessary, to report it to the fiscal, which carries uh, in, in this uh, in this instance a five thousand or maximum five thousand uh, pound fine. So I think the deterrent there uh, is, is is a very strong one. So yes, we're very confident in the regulations uh, that we have and our ability to enforce them. Thanks very much. And uh, our last person is Tom Magner from Carers World. Tom. Tom with us? No, unfortunately, it looks like Tom isn't with us today, but uh, perhaps he'll be able to join us on another day. So that concludes uh, all the questions from the journalists who've joined us today. Uh, before we uh, end, can I uh, simply uh, ask you to do two things, to uh, remember the guidance that is there, the importance of sticking to those rules, uh, because by doing that, we move ever closer to being able to take decisions that may ease other areas of the lockdown. But very, very importantly, what we are doing is protecting our own health, the health of our family and our loved ones, and the health of each other. So to everyone who, uh, I know it's tough, it's especially tough when the weather looks good, um, it's hard if we get rain today not to want to meet indoors. Please do not do that. Please stick to the rules. And for all of you who are doing that, the vast majority of people in Scotland, you have my very grateful thanks. Finally, let me thank uh, both Jason and Hamza for joining uh, me today, Robert, who's our sign language interpreter, and all of you for taking the time to join this briefing. We'll be back tomorrow at the usual time of 12.30 with the First Minister. For now, thank you very much.